Okay, everyone. Uh, so I think we're ready now. So my name is Paul Sharp. I'm organizing this uh, series of lectures on the history of capitalism together with Yappa, who's sitting at the front. And I'd like to uh, welcome you to this latest installment of this history of capitalism series of lectures today with uh, Kevin Yotsoy Rock. I think it's important to have the Yotsoy in this, in this setting at least. Uh, he is a professor of economics at NYU Abu Dhabi. Uh, his education is from Trinity College Dublin and from Harvard. He's a member of the Royal Irish Academy, a fellow of the British Academy, former research director of CPR, and he's previously served as president of the European Historical Economic Society. He's a former editor of the European Review of Economic History, a former research director of the Centre for Economic Policy Research in London. Uh, so in other words, he's a very well-connected and very uh, high-achieving um, guest we have today. His research lies at the intersection of economic history and international economics. He's published widely, including books on globalization, trade, and most recently on Brexit. Uh, he was awarded an ERC Advance Grant in 2009 to study interwar trade and trade policy. And then I can say on a personal note that his prize-winning uh, book, Globalization and History, together with uh, Jeffrey Williamson, was a great inspiration for my own PhD thesis, as I think he knows. Uh, and he is also, of course, one of the select group of scholars who has published uh, on the history of both the Danish and the Irish uh, dairy industry. And today he's going to talk to us about uh, globalization and varieties of backlash. Over to you. Is it that? Yeah, that's it. Okay. All right. So I suppose it's very difficult you know, now to think of anything other than this, this dreadful war in Ukraine. And uh, I'd like to dedicate this talk to my, my very good friends in the Catholic University in Lviv, who are living through this right now. Um, and if you're a historian of globalization, which I've been for the last 30 years, well, you're also a historian of deglobalization, you know, and, and we've seen all of this before, and it's, it was amazing how right across the world uh, on February 24, almost simultaneously, I mean, everybody realized that the current phase of globalization that we've been living through that began with the end of the Cold War and China's opening to the West is over. Now, how over it is, how far that unraveling will go, we don't know yet. It'll depend largely on Chinese choices, I suppose, but we all had the sense that something uh, irreversible, at least in the short to medium run, uh, had happened. And if you're an economic historian and you think about war and deglobalization, you immediately start thinking about 1914. And once you start thinking about 1914, then it's de rigueur to quote this bit of Keynes, which is so well known that it's basically a cliche. It's what everybody quotes. Uh, he rem he's, it's from the economic consequences of the peace in 19 18, 1919. And he's saying, you know, it was amazing. You know, the world before World War I, you could sit in bed in your silk sheets, sipping your tea, reading The Guardian and speculating on Argentinian railway shares. And this was all brought to an end by the beginning of World War I. Uh, well, actually, in his quote, he says, came to an end in August 1914. But that's a separate question from, did it come to an end because of August 1914? Was there, uh, you know, uh, an uninterrupted phase of globalization that just suddenly and abruptly and exogenously came to an end because of World War I? Well, that's an interesting question that you can uh, ask. And I suppose similarly, if in, you know, 50 years time, uh, it seems that February 20, uh, 2022 was a, was a sejura of some sort, then you can imagine that historians might ask whether this phase of globalization, whose fate remains uncertain, actually ended because of what is happening now in Ukraine. And that may be something that they will have intellectual debates about in the future. So um, I am a historian of, of globalization. When we started in the 1990s, I suppose there were two things that those of us who are connected with the, the NBER, I suppose, largely in Cambridge, Massachusetts, a uh, group around Jeffrey Williamson, myself, Tim Hatton, Alan Taylor, there was a few others as well. What we were all uh, doing in the first instance was asking whether this globalization that was emerging in the 1990s was really as unprecedented and new 
as journalists and commentators at the time said it was. And, and part of our agenda, but it wasn't just our agenda, it was also the agenda of other social scientists, for example, sociologists, was to say, actually, this is not completely new. You know, we have seen globalization uh, before. So that was partly what we were arguing. But we were also actually interested in addressing this issue of whether the First World War had caused the breakdown exogenously of globalization that was otherwise completely healthy and flourishing. And the main point, I suppose, in the book that Paul uh, referred to there earlier, globalization, was that actually, no, uh, there was already uh, a political, a domestic political backlash that was weakening globalization from within. And what we were, uh, yes, and, and so the question then I suppose that you may ask yourself is in 20 years time, if 2022 does seem like a real turning point, you know, it will be legitimate to ask whether it really was the exogenous turning point or were the seeds of what may be about to happen already present in 2021 or 2020. Um, so what I wanna talk about is different ways in which globalization can be undermined from within, endogenously, by itself. I'm going to talk about a longer run uh, uh, impacts on income distribution. I'm gonna talk about macroeconomic instability. And finally, I wanna talk a little bit about strategic issues, um, which are very much to the fore today, but which also you can see clear echoes of in the past. So let me begin with income distribution. Um, what we did in the 1990s is we made a three-step argument, essentially. So the first step was that the globalization of the 19th century, which as we all know began in 1815 and ended in 1914, uh, was dramatic. It was new, uh, had been globalization before then, of course. I'm not gonna go down that particular uh, rabbit hole. Uh, I wrote a book later with Ronald Findlay where we kind of brought the story back to the year 1000 and maybe even uh, earlier, but uh, there was something new about the 19th century experience of globalization. I do still believe that, actually. Uh, and it was driven above all by technological change. I mean, trade policy had a role as well. Geopolitics has a role as well. I mentioned that, but above all, this is a technological story, number one. Number two, this globalization had an effect on income distribution. And number three, this led, maybe predictably enough, to an anti-globalization backlash well before World War I. So that's what we did. So just to sort of uh, recap briefly on that. I mean, there's a background to all of this. Yeah, I mean, our, our book started the story in 1870, but really we should have started it in 1815. Uh, you know, I think, I think there's this interesting transitional phase between 1815 and 1830, 1840, that not enough economic historians write about. It's really interesting, I think. Uh, certainly from the 1840s, trade policy is liberalizing and, uh, and so on. So there's a, there's a liberalization of trade policy across certainly Western Europe from 1815 onwards. This is the period of European expansion overseas, so this is the age of imperialism, so especially in the late 19th century, Europeans are going to generously bestow the benefits, or not, as, you, as the case may be, of free-ish trade or free trade on their colonies and on uh, their, uh, well, their, 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 their almost colonies, you know? And uh, in the case of countries like China, Japan, Persia, Turkey, that they never conquered. Thailand, they sort of impose unequal trade treaties that also commit those countries to, uh, to very low tariffs. I mean, the Americas, they're independent republics by and large, and they actually are still quite protectionist, but that's another story. Uh, along, uh, uh, in much of the world, you have a move towards freer trade, underpinned by the Pax Britannica. Uh, so the Brits, for various strategic reasons, they need to import food and raw materials, so they need a big navy, and they basically are committed all in to kind of freedom of navigation for everybody. So they're providing, you could call them global services of the sort that the US Navy is uh, providing today. Not that everybody thinks that they're global services and Chinese certainly don't. So there's that whole uh, uh, analogy that you could make. And then within that background then, this is gonna give full reign to the, uh, these technological forces and that last bullet point to work their way through. So steamships, railroads, the telegraph, these are the kind of containers and internet of the day, and they have dramatic effects on markets. So um, this is, you know, a, an index of transport costs. Well, you can see there are two indices there. So you're supposed to believe the one uh, marked the British 
index. The North index is a sort of idiosyncratic one that is largely, I think, weighted towards cotton coming from America. And I think there are, it, well, also you'll see there's a suspiciously straight line there at the start. And when there is a suspiciously straight line, you've got to think, well, well there are not too many data points probably. Um, and there's something about, you know, cotton. It's a fluffy good, you know. So the key thing is can you make it compact? So I understand that the old technology used to be sailors jumping up and down the cotton to flatten it, then they'd discover something more efficient and so on. So if you sort of abstract from that and generalize to a broader range of goods, this is from Nick Harley, uh, this British index, you can see it wiggles around, but it's basically pretty flat until some point in the 1840s, you will note. And so Nick produced that index and he said, this is telling you that globalization is technological rather than political because North's interpretation of his index was it had to do with things like suppression of piracy and safer travel and so on. And North is saying, no, this is, or Harley is saying, no, this is steamships. So 1840-ish. Okay, so I'm going to get in trouble with Paul because, I mean, when he said that I, I influenced his early work greatly, I mean, his, his early work was largely dedicated to trying to shoot down O'Rourke and Williamson in as many, in many ways as he could. But, you know, that's, that's, how, that's, how, that's how knowledge moves on, you know. Um, but so here's a undoubtedly very imperfect uh, a measure of price differences between Britain and America. Very imperfect, actually. Uh, but uh, what you can see is that these price gaps, you know, in the early, in the early phase, you know, they're what they're, you know, about 100%, but there's huge fluctuations. Even the huge fluctuations is telling you that these prices aren't very tightly linked to each other, you know. And then you can see that something happens. Oh, when does it happen? Oh, around about 1840. So that's kind of interesting. And this is what's happening to the volume of trade in wheat before, uh, you know, between across the Atlantic. And you can see that, you know, there is trade there. And if I extrapolate it back, you'd find that there's trade there too, by the way, you know, uh, but it's off the scale, you know, something very dramatic happens. I know it looks like it's about 1840. Okay, so now I'm going to get in trouble with Paul, maybe not, I don't know. Uh, so this, is, this is globalization. You know, you see a technological shock, you see falling price gaps, you see an explosion in trade. That's globalization. Um, and that applied winners and losers. And a lot of the work that we were doing was trying to draw causal links between that globalization and the effects on income distribution, which isn't obvious if you think about it. If you think about today, you know, there's trade with China, there are unskilled workers across the West who are doing badly, right? There's a good theoretical reason to believe that those two phenomena are linked. But you can also clearly argue that other stuff could be hurting the unskilled workers. It could be technological change. If you're thinking about England and America, it could be trade unions being destroyed systematically since the 80s. You know, there's lots of other things that are happening. So how do you actually draw those causal links is difficult. And so that's a lot of what we were doing back then. Um, but we convinced ourselves, to our own satisfaction anyway, that you can draw these causal links. I mean, very broad, very basically, you know, if you're a European worker uh, in Britain, you know, this, this trade means cheap food. And actually, just that, that very simple fact accounts for a big share of the... Uh, we, we, we thought we, 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 we showed that, that cheap food accounts for a surprisingly big chunk of the real wage gains of English workers uh, in the late 19th century. Really quite surprisingly large, I think. Um, but it sort of makes sense. And by the way, there is a direct an an analogy there with today as well, because I mean, there was a paper recently, I don't know what happened to it, arguing that actually unskilled workers in America don't lose because they trade with China, because you know, they buy stuff in Walmart, you know, and that's, that's like buying cheap food. You know? So there's the demand for labor, but then there's also the cost of the stuff that you're, you're, you're buying. So there's an ambiguity there that's well known in trade theory. But anyway, we, we, we think that a large chunk of, of European real wedge gains were in fact due, due, due to this trade. But on the other hand, if you're a landowner, you could be a big aristocratic landowner, like in England, you could be a French peasant. You know, if you derive income from land, this cheap food isn't necessarily going to be very good for you. And in Britain, which is the country where we can see the experiment ro ro roll through, unimpeded by trade policy considerations because they maintain free trade, land rents fall by some 50%. And we, you know, using the tools available at our time, convinced ourselves that actually the bulk of that was due to trade and to these falling food prices.
So you have globalization, implying changing uh, prices, implying winners and losers. So here, for example, we have data on uh, land rent, the incomes of landowners relative to, relative to the incomes of wages. So this is not saying that in Denmark farmers did worse, because we know they didn't, right? It's saying that workers did even better. Now, now this, these are data that we put together back then, 20 years ago, so, so uh, would, would more recent data still show the same thing? I don't know. Uh, what you can, I, mean, I mean, in Britain, I, I'm sure that this is, this is absolutely okay, because those land rents did fall by about 50%, you know, and wages did rise. So clearly, there was a big increase in the relative incomes of, of poor workers relative to, in the British context, rich landowners. You know, Danish landowners are obviously very different uh, in type at this time. And so you have these relative, and, and by the way, if you think this is just a continuation of a long run trend, you'd be wrong. Because if you draw similar, if you extrapolate these things backwards, what you find is that for a period of several centuries in England, landowners have been doing better relative to workers. Land rents have been going up relative to wages, which is what you would expect in a basically Malthusian world. Because in a basically Malthusian world, you know, the wage will be kind of relatively stable, but with population growth, there'll be an increase in the demand for food and food prices will go up. And well, with population growth, the land rent should go up. No? And so you should see the, the landowners doing better relative to the workers. This happened for a period of several centuries and then it reverses. When? Oh, about 1840, actually, you know? So anyway, uh, and the point is people don't like this. You know, if you're a, I mean, in Denmark, it's okay because actually land rents are going up in, in absolute terms. You know, and we know that the Danes don't protect their agricultural markets. There was no reason to because their farmers were doing well, actually. Uh, but in England, they weren't. They were losing in absolute terms. And in many other parts of Europe, they weren't. And so it wouldn't be surprising to find that they protected themselves. And that's exactly what happened. And so starting in the 18, 1879 is often taken as the turning point in Germany uh, when Bismarck introduces this tariff on iron and rye. You know, so it's the landowners that are losing. So the rye gets protected, and then the, the heavy industry gets in on the act as well. In France, there's the, the Maline tariff, you know, in, in Italy, which has been very liberal under Cavour, you know, who's a you know, classic so liberal kind of guy. You know, they're free traders at the start. They move towards uh, protection. Sweden, you know, moves towards protection and so on. So it's, it's, it's pretty ubiquitous across Western Europe, with these interesting exceptions, Denmark, Britain, and so on. Uh, and so, and you know, these, 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 these um, interventions are significant. So here, for example, we have, this is the, this is the, the German tariff on, what is it? It's, it's wheat. So it's basically zero. And then they impose the tariff. So it's in percentage terms. And the other uh, series on this graph, it's, it's the percentage by which Prussian wheat prices exceed Danish wheat prices. And you could think of Danish wheat prices being the free trade price of wheat in this sort of part of the world. And what you can see is that the tariffs go up to, you know, 20, 30 percent. And that succeeds in raising Prussian wheat prices above Danish wheat prices by the same amount, roughly speaking. So this is these are significant interventions. And of course, along with that, then there are going to be ideological and political implications. There's, you know, because there are going to be people arguing for protection. That's going to have its own political effect. Not all these people in Prussia are saints. And Gershon Kuhn had a lot to say about that in his famous book on bread and democracy in Germany. OK, so that's trade. More briefly, there, there's something similar happening in labor markets. You have to be careful here because there's a lot of other stuff going on as well. But you know, this is the classic phase of free migration. So you don't have exit restraints, by and large. You know, once the restrictions on, on outward mobility have been relaxed, uh, the, the receiving countries, they're, they're, as I'm going to tell you, they are beginning to restrict immigration, but basically for a lot of the period they're not. And they have, you know, tens of millions of Europeans moving to the new world uh, between 1815 and 1914. And you, I mean, big numbers, I mean, big uh, relative to the sizes of the populations in the sending countries, like Ireland, big relative to the populations of the receiving countries like Argentina. I mean, very big. And it would be surprising if this had no effect on wages. Now, of course, there are many other things that could be affecting wages as well. 
you know, this is always the problem, you know, so how do you try to get a handle on this? Well, Claudia Golden, I think, probably had, I think, the most careful of all of these studies. So she had city-level wedge data uh, and city-level data on numbers of immigrants, and she found pretty sizable effects of, of immigration on wages, native wa on wages. No, I can't say native wages, it was just wages, uh, with, the, with the effect being negative, you know, more people, lower wages, other things being equal, you know? Uh, now, I mean, on top of that, and this is a point that, you know, you could make about David Carr's Miami boat lift paper, for example, for those economists here who know about that, you know, if you take a bunch of people and you drop them in a city in America, would you necessarily find that that city's wages fall relative to cities elsewhere? I'm not necessarily, right? right? If workers are mobile between the cities, then you might find no relative effect, you know? Uh, but she did find an effect, and, and this is the point that uh, Leah and, and Ram, Ram make. And actually, there is evidence that when people came in to cities in the East Coast, for example, natives move further west, for example. Um, and, and, and Bill Collins, in a, who's now a, all grown up and an important person in economic history, but his dissertation was on uh, these, these matters. And I'm not sure if it published this paper. We had an interesting argument about it. Think about the big internal population movement within the states in the 20th century was the movement of, of African Americans from the south to the north. And he argues that that might have happened earlier if there hadn't been all the Irish people and Poles and so on, Italians moving into the northern cities, you know. So all that is consistent with there being an effect of immigration on wages. Now, obviously, that's a hugely politically fraught topic, and it became a lot more fraught after Donald Trump was elected, you know. But, you know, facts are facts. And, well, I'm not saying these are facts because these are scientific findings, so they're not facts. You know, they're, they're statements about cause and effect, so we can always debate these, right? Um, yeah, I think we all pretty well managed to convince ourselves that there was an effect in labor markets. But the point is, these were huge migration flows, but they were really huge. There were these very small migration flows that we have today where labor markets are very restricted, actually, where there are minimum wages and all of that kind of stuff, you know? Uh, so there were migration, there were wage effects of immigration, and it looked like there were then political effects of that in turn, you know? So Claudia in that same paper found that uh, if you were in a, a city where wages were, were not doing as well, you were more likely to vote for immigration restrictions, for example, you know? So, there was a, a backlash there as well, although I, I certainly would want to emphasize, if you look at the American legislation, not just the American legislation, actually, there's this obsessive focus with Asian, Asian immigration in particular that tells you that it's not just economics, right? There's other stuff going on as well. And, I mean, you 100% want to, want to argue that, I think. Okay. Now, are there any links between that late 19th century anti-globalization experience and what we've seen? recently. So the economists will all know this paper, I guess, the non-economist one. This is very well-known paper by uh, David Autor and colleagues. They're looking at the effect of, of, of import competition from China uh, after 2001, when China is admitted to the World Trade Organization. And what they're doing is they're kind of doing what Claudia Golden was doing. They're kind of using cross-sectional variation in outcomes across America and linking that with, in this case, Chinese import competition. And so in, pot potentially their findings would then be subject to the same criticism that you could make of similar immigration exercises. You know, if workers are completely mobile across US labor markets, then there should be no difference in wage outcomes no matter where you are. But actually what's interesting is they find that there are wage imp implications. So they, they look and see whether before this uh, Chinese import shock, you were producing goods that were more likely to be competed against by China, and so on. And what they find is that if you were more exposed ex ante to this shock, then, then you lose manufacturing jobs. That's the effect on changes in the number of workers. The effects are pretty big. And in the non-manufacturing sector, the wages are going down, okay? So I should say now, that's not exactly the kind of Hector Roland story that we were telling for the 19th century, because we were telling a, a classic Hector Roland story uh, where you have trade, uh, where you have trade hurting scarce factors and benefiting abundant factors. And the point about that trade model uh, for non-economists is actually you're assuming that, that wages are, are the same across industry because workers are completely mobile across the country and the capital is, you know, gets equal returns. You know, so it's, it's as if the whole country is just a point you know, with, with uh, uniform wages and profits within that point. Okay, so we were extracting from these 
regional differences. You know, but actually, if you think about the electoral geography of any Western European country today, what's, what stares out at you, and we saw it in France as well last week, the big regional differences, right? And those regional differences correspond to regional outcomes, such as these ones here. So it's telling you that actually in the real world today, people aren't as mobile as some of our models uh, sometimes uh, assume they are. And the point is that this had political implications in the state. So in another paper, author and uh, another group of co-authors find that basically the more uh, Chinese import competition made itself felt, uh, the more people increased their votes for Republicans, which, I mean, in the context of America of that particular time, you know, meant, you know, they're going to be more likely to vote for Trump, you know. Um, so globalization, winners and losers, backlash. Same thing, you know, slightly different nuances in terms of the way you're thinking about it, you know, in terms of the models, underlying models, mobile factors, immobile factors, but same basic story. I would argue, and it's not just uh, America. So this, these are two, I mean, I think this ended up in the American Political Science Review, these two, these two political scientists. So this is already voting for Brexit. So, so is, is the Brexit vote related to how many immigrants there are? Because of course we know that there was a huge anti-immigrant thing going on in Britain. And actually, if anything, there's a negative correlation. And then if, you know, the right point to make there is, well, of course, because if you're an immigrant, you're not going to move to somewhere where they hate Europe, right? Probably, right? So the, the, the causation could be the other way around. Fine. And that, that's, that's a well-known problem when people look at these, these things. But here's the China import shock. Same thing. They do it the same way. And the more the region in Britain was exposed to the China import shock, the more they voted for Brexit. Now, you might say, well, you know, they, 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 were, they were aiming at the wrong target, these voters, you know, because this is, you know, this is not Europe, this is China. They're actually different, you know. But, you know, uh, you can see how in the context of a, of a debate like that, it could become a referendum on free trade in general. I was in France in 2005, was it, when they had the referendum on the first constitutional, you know, the first, the first referendum on the constitutional treaty that you know, there was going to be uh, equestrian statues of Giscard d'Etain all around Europe as the new father of Europe, and French voted against it. And I mean, it was just a, a, a referendum about boring vote rules and so on like that in Brussels, but it actually became a referendum about free trade in general. So that, that's the sort of thing that can happen. And you know, I think that's, that's, that's sort of pretty convincing. Now, you could argue, by the way, and some people have, that uh, all that's happening here is that you know these people who are losing these their jobs and so on these unskilled workers whoops these unskilled workers the problem is that they didn't go to university like us and so they just don't understand the benefits of free trade you know and i've that that point has been made in print by by well-known political scientists and you know anything is possible Cor you know it's just a correlation i do need to convince you of the mechanism my counter to that is that if that were the case, then you'd expect that to be the same everywhere. You know, uh, you know less well-educated people in poor countries would be just as confused as less well-educated people in rich countries, okay? But what you actually find is, so this is from an old paper of mine now, so it's based on 1990s data, you know? But this is, uh, this is the correlation between being, between being low-skilled and being in favor of free trade, okay? It's the correlation between being low-skilled and being in favor of free trade. So what that's saying is that over here, the correlation is negative. So the low skilled are hostile to free trade. But what you notice is that that's true here. It's not true up here, you know, in the poorer countries. Actually, there the poor seem to be quite okay with free trade. Now, I'm not, now I haven't drawn the standard errors around those data points, but you know, uh, more recently, so, because you know, people do this now. So here we have, so people who say that trade destroys jobs, lots of people say that trade destroys jobs in the USA. You know, very few people in Vietnam say that trade destroys jobs. Not a big surprise, right? Not a big surprise. So I look at these, and you can, you can read the other graphs yourselves. So I, I, I put this, this, these data, data slides together with my earlier thing. I, I feel okay about arguing that there's something economic going on. It's not just rednecks who are confused. Right? That people, I mean, that's, and that is the basic, you know, 
if there's a, what's the Germans have this phrase, Fachidiot, you know? And I mean, the, 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 so the, uh, the economist Fachidiot see is we, we always tend to assume that people are rational. I know there's a behaviorists and so on, but basically we assume that people understand what's good for themselves, right? Uh, which actually I think is okay compared to some of the alternatives, you know? And I think that these people you know, basically understand what's, what's, what's going on and they're voting accordingly. So I would say that there is a backlash story there. Okay, now then the question is what you do about it. It's all very interesting, what you do about it. So uh, I like this, this, uh, this, this story of Aesop, you know. So on the one hand, you have the oak tree, which if it spoke would probably speak with a German accent. She's a little bit rigid and, and likes his principles and doesn't, does, doesn't bend and so on. And on the other hand, you have the reeds and they're very floppy. They're what would have been called wet in Britain in the 1980s, and they blow this way and that with the prevailing winds. But the moral of the story is that when the storm comes, you know, the, the reeds are still standing and the oak tree is flat in its arse, you know. So the question is, what are the shock absorbers? So shock absorbers are a good thing. That's the moral of the story. So what are the shock absorbers that could avoid anti-globalization backlashes caused by globalization creating losers is the issue. And here, and that was the big lacuna of, in this book, Globalization History, our basic model of politics was it reduced to do you stay with free trade or open labor markets or do you go protectionist, you know, which is pretty narrow range of choices for politicians to have. And actually, the late 19th century was more interesting than that. And so I always cite Michael Huberman at this point when I teach this stuff to, to students because he's done great work saying actually there was alternatives. So, so during precisely the first globalization in all these countries, there were all of these uh, inspection requirements, labor legislation to protect vulnerable workers and so on. And even more tellingly, there was social insurance of various sorts that was brought in. Uh, accident insurance, employment insurance and so on. Old pension, old age pensions, for example, in 1908. Which means that if any of you have English ancestors, one amusing thing that you can do is you can look them up online in 1901. You can then look them up online in 1911 and you can see how much older they were in 1911 than in 1901. And, you know, you may be expecting 10 years, but actually you may find that they mysteriously aged by 13 or 14 or 15 years because they had the old age pension put in in 1908. And I mean, this is not just, I'm not making this up, and I mean, you can actually find it in my own family also, uh, who are even better spending British taxpayers' money rather than Irish taxpayers' money. Um, so this looks, it's not the welfare state, but it's something that's gonna evolve into the welfare state eventually, I suppose. And the point that Michael makes is that this is actually positively correlated with globalization. You see more of this going on in small open economies that are open to trade than in larger closed economies. And of course, I mean, we're in a country, Denmark, that has always been pretty open, actually, you know, and has had, you know, a pretty well-developed welfare state and that hasn't necessarily thought that, you know, being open to business and trade meant that you didn't have to have a welfare state, right? And that seemed to be a sort of a general a general thing. More, more broadly, in, in other papers, Michael and, and Meisner, they say that trade treaties during this period were often used as mechanisms to raise up standards, you know, because I want to sell you stuff and I have an incentive to be nice to you. And you may well say to me, well, you can sell me stuff, but we want you to have the same unemployment insurance provisions as, as we do, because otherwise it would be unfair. And actually there was a lot of that. So there was a kind of progressive globalization that involved trade treaties actually leveling up standards during this period. And, 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 and by the way, yes, I mean, EU integration, that's, that's what the whole thing is based on, right? Uh, so, you know, it's not just a trade agreement, right? There's all this stuff right back in 1957, you know, all this stuff about you know, workers' rights and uh, equal pay for men and women, for example. Do we think that's because the Christian Democrats in the 1950s were feminist? No, probably, right? It's probably because they didn't want unfair competition, right, from other countries that weren't doing, you know, what they were doing, right? So there was this kind of leveling up uh, associated with, you know, the, the incentive to sell to other countries. Okay, but it's not clear, I guess, that is a point that that's how globalization is perceived today, right? I don't think we probably think of globalization think, oh yeah, that's all about le leveling up labor standards, right? And that, that may be uh, a problem. And I should also note that, you know, 2016 was Brexit, it was Trump, and where have these safety nets been dismantled the most? And the answer is probably Britain and America, right? Much more so than on the European continent. Okay.
So, you know, my basic story is there's globalization. This is putting vulnerable workers under stress just when they need a state to help them. You know, David Cameron goes on a massive austerity program in 2010 and you have the inevitable you know, conclusion. That's a very economistic uh, explanation for Brexit. I think there's a lot to it, but I, mean, I should mention, though, that it is complicated, you know, because, because you know, uh, you know and this is the way you set up a, an undergraduate lecture, right? You say, is it economic or is it cultural? You know, and the, the, the correct answer is usually both, you know? Uh, so, you know, there is a tradition of British Euroscepticism. There was Russian interference, you know, there was fake news and so on, uh, you know, but there are also you know, systematic things that are operating across countries, like, you know, like globalization. That's what I've been emphasizing. There's idiosyncratic economic facts, things. You know, this has been happening everywhere, obviously. And uh, we know all about that now. Okay. So that was, that was, that was a lot about income distribution. More, more quickly, let me talk about macro instability and backlash. And that's where I bring in the 1930s, which is a great period of deglobalization, of course. So the first thing is, uh, it's very clear that it's not protection that causes the Great Depression, it's the Great Depression that causes protection. So that just get me that, I won't belabor that point, but that's, it's, a, it's an important point. Uh, and those flawed macroeconomic policies that led to the Great Depression, I mean, I'll show you some slides in a moment, but they were, they were remembered uh, by policymakers, especially in America at the time, Alan Greenspan, uh, Christy Romer, uh, who was also in the White House at the time. These were all historians of the Great Depression. And so by and large, after 28, we did a lot, a lot better. I, because this is a, a talk about globalization, you know, it's, it's important to say that globalization is part of the Great Depression story. And we didn't necessarily teach it that way before 2008. So this is one way in which the present informed our understanding of the past. Because especially in Europe after 2010, it was very obvious that big capital flows were a big part of the problem. Big capital flows to Ireland, to Spain, to Portugal, to Greece, to Italy, and then those capital flows stop. And when they stop, there's the, same, the problems that you always have when massive capital flows stop. Okay, you have overinflated house prices or asset prices or too much government debt, and then there's a huge problem afterwards, okay? And this was a systemic issue happening right across the Eurozone. And so uh, when that happened, uh, people like myself looked at the Great Depression, and we looked at it, I suppose, with new eyes, we looked at it as, as if we had been German economic historians, actually, because it's something the Germans never forgot, you know, that in the 1920s, there was a huge flow of capital from America to Germany and elsewhere, and after 1928, you know, partly so that the Germans could keep up their reparation payments, and then when those, those capital flows stopped, they were in big trouble, you know, and you have the banking crises, the combined banking crises and currency crises in Austria, in Hungary, in Germany, and so on. So, so very similar. And you know, one thing about, you know, there are different dimensions of globalization. Some are more useful than others. You know, trade is pretty useful. You know, migration would be extremely useful were it politically feasible, you know, and you know, then we can debate how politically feasible it is. Hard to see a great argument for, you know, unrestricted capital flows. That's my own particular bias. Yes, in principle, it can fund it, funnel money to poor countries and help them develop. On the other hand, what's been happening recently, it's been the Chinese sending money to the Americans so they can consume more. So how, how useful is that, you know? And it's always been associated with banking crises. Uh, in the 19th century, uh, since the 1990s, uh, of, you know, uh, and, and the interwar period uh, also. Um, these capital flows had largely been facilitated by the gold standard. And one of the great tragedies of the interwar period is that the good guys at that time the nice people who didn't like nationalism and so on were all in favor of the gold standard because that signified that you were a liberal internationalist kind of person, you know, who didn't like all of this nationalism and xenophobia and stuff. But the point is, the gold standard was a terrible idea, you know. It was a terrible idea. And, and, and when nice people believe stupid things about, especially monetary policy, that can actually be a very dangerous thing. Uh, the gold standard led to the transmission of shocks across countries, this is what Barry Eichengreen and others have always uh, emphasized, and it makes adjustment difficult or impossible. So, so this is what happened during the Great Depression. So, so these are interest rates after 2008, and here are interest rates after 1929. So the red is always today, after 2008. The other ones are always back then. And you can see that back then the interest rates stayed high, and very often they spiked 
you know, they actually went up. And that was because there was a run on the currency and they're trying to stay on gold and they were losing gold and staying on gold was the only thing that mattered. And so in the middle of the Great Depression, you raise your interest rates, which is a really bad idea, you know. And the other thing that happened, and it was, this is less mechanically linked to the gold standard, but, but, but Temin and Ike and Green talk, talk about mortality and things, is that countries ran very restrictive budget deficits, very restrictive fiscal policy. So there wasn't the huge budget deficits that we saw after 2008, you know, but that turns out to be a really bad thing. So here I have their government deficits, and I, the red line is 3%. Why 3%? Well, you all know why 3%, but actually, even still, I say to you, why 3%, right? It's just a number picked out of the air, right? There's, there's no scientific basis to saying the budget deficit should be 3% of GDP. It's supposedly something some guy just wrote down on a napkin in a cafe in Paris at some point in the 1990s. It, there's no reason why any, you know, but actually the good news is that these countries were all running deficits. Actually, some of them were running surpluses, you know? Uh, so that's really bad news because if you're in the middle of the Great Depression, your budget deficit is automatically going to increase. And if you're going to try to keep it under control, which these guys all did, you're going to raise taxes and cut expenditure right in the middle of the Great Depression. And that's also a really bad idea, you know? So they made terrible, they, made, they, were, they, were, they were terrible, you know? The, the policymakers of the time, and this is one of the most famous diagrams in all of economic history, due to Icon Green and Sachs. It shows you the countries recovered when they left the gold standard in 1931, in Britain in 1933, in Germany and America in rather different political circumstances, and only in 1936 in France, okay? And the, the problem is, you know, the gold standard was a symbol of globalization, and it was also the symbol of the international economy. And the other point to make is that the countries that stayed on gold the longest were the ones who ended up being most protectionist. So you have this great irony that the gold standard, which symbolized globalization, which helped bring about capital flows actually ended up leading countries to be more protectionist just because, well, they had no freedom of maneuver. They were in the middle of the Great Depression. They couldn't do anything about it. They couldn't adjust the monetary policy. They couldn't adjust the fiscal policy. What did they have left? They had protection. And so something that was supposed to symbolize an open economy actually ended up giving rise to some of the most destructive protectionisms of the period. You know, and then, of course, there were even more serious consequences, but, you know, you shouldn't talk about Nazis, that's, you know, but, but there, were, there were those two. All right. Again, think of Aesop's fable, what could you do about it, you know? And so this is a great book by a political scientist in, I think she's in Colombia, and, well, you can all read it, you all have the language skills, so it's two, and, and, and the story of the book is on the cover of the book. You, you can judge this book by the cover. You can certainly summarize this book by the cover. So it's two election posters, one in Germany, right, one in Sweden. And the point is the Swedish Social Democrats at this point were no longer Marxist. That's the point. Whereas in Germany, they kind of were, which meant that they, in Germany, the Social Democrats, they weren't really sure should they do something about the Great Depression or wait for the inevitable fall of capitalism. And there was, an, there was a debate within the Social Democrats in Germany. Should we have a massive you know, government spending policy, this type of stuff? Finally, they said, no, the doctrinaires went out. Whereas in Sweden, they were already Social Democrats. So, of course, you know. So, and, the, you know, and so it, who, who is going to ask, offer Arbeit and Obrot in uh, Germany? And we know who was, you know. So the point is that you know, this was a period where basically people like private property. They, broadly speaking, weren't going to vote for the communists. So they, you know, they weren't going to vote for the communists necessarily, but they wanted governments to step in and do something to help them. They weren't prepared to leave it to the market. They wanted counter-cyclical policy. They wanted government expenditure. They wanted flexibility in policy. And the point about the gold standard is it constrained you. Constrained you. There was no flexibility. Okay. Uh, where parties offered that alternative policy space, they, they won. You know, whether it was Sweden, whether it was the nationalists in Ireland at the time, you know, people loved that. Where, where, where the good guys said, we feel your pain, but we can't do anything about it. Well, then really bad guys took over. Okay, finally, strategy. So one of the interesting things about the interwar period is not just that there was protectionism, but that it was very biased uh, in favor of trading blocks. So rather than me buying from one country and selling to another country, I'm more and more buying and selling to the same, same country. There is more bilateral. You can see, for example, a big increase in the share of trade being done with colonies. So there's the French share of their imports from the French Empire, exports to the French Empire. So there's all these big blocks 
forming. And what I've been doing for the last 10 years is trying to see what the causes of this are. We've been collecting micro data on, no, not micro data, but disaggregated data on trade by commodity and trade policy by commodity and trade partners. This is, for example, recent stuff we're doing on India. So India protects its markets. Okay, so it protects its markets, but actually it needs some, the protection leads to more imports from the UK. And that's because Indian protection is lowering overall imports, but it's increasing the share of the imports that are going to Britain. And that's because it's protecting British goods less than other people's goods. Okay, so the British are the big winners, and actually the effects are pretty big. There are error, there are error bands around these things, and I won't go into that. And, and, and a bigger, even bigger effect on cotton cloth exports. So if Britain wins, who loses in India? So you probably guess, right? So it's going to be Japan, right? So big, big decline in Japanese exports to India. And the point is this is happening to Japanese exports in other Western markets also. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to bet, even though I haven't done the work yet. Uh, a huge effect on cotton cloth exports. And the point is that this was viewed at the time as very dangerous, okay? So there are various statements here to that effect by contemporaries. Um, uh, Volker Hilgert, for example, so he says, he says basically, it renders the supply of raw materials to certain countries difficult. And why would it do that? Well, it's because if you're Germany, let's say, you get it, you're not necessarily, how are you paying for your raw materials with exports of manufactured goods, yes? Or if you're Japan, same story. But you're not selling your manufactured goods to the same countries that you're getting your raw materials from. You know, the Germans are selling their manufactured goods to the Brits and the Americans and buying their raw materials from other places, right? So they need this multilateral trading system to work. And if it breaks down, then you start to worry about these things. And when people start to worry about raw material supply, that can be very dangerous, more systematically and generally. Um, well, I mean, I should say, by the way, I mean, there, there are, are recent historians who have pointed out that you know, World War I didn't necessarily lead to the end of globalization because it was a world war. I'll pass over that. Uh, I'll pass over that. Um, what I want to, uh, let me pass over all of this. And let me get onto the question of, was World War I exogenous? Because that's where I started. World War I is an exogenous shock. But should we think of World War I as an exogenous shock, or did it come from somewhere? And if it came from somewhere, is partly what caused it globalization. Can we think of uh, causal mechanisms there? So Tuz and Fertig in this rather nice article there point, point out the most obvious one, which is that globalization helps poorer countries catch up on richer countries. You can see that big time with China today. Is that making the world more stable? Not necessarily, right? Uh, back then, Russia, you know, not very globalized, but they are importing Western technology. They are growing up. We know that the Germans are worried about a rising Russia, for example, before 1914. Uh, um, secondly, and more subtly, with globalization, if you're industrializing, you're becoming more and more like Britain or Germany or, or Japan you're more and more having to import food and raw materials, right? To feed your people in your factories. And you're having to pay for that with exports of manufactured goods. And this leaves you potentially vulnerable to blockade, okay? You start to worry. Once war becomes a possibility, then you start to worry about this because this is a potential vulnerability, you know? The British Navy could blockade you if you're Germany. And so Germans start worrying about that. And then the Germans start saying, well, actually we could do the same with the Brits. You know, this didn't cause World War I at all, I'm saying that. It did give rise to Anglo-German naval trade rivalries that we know about. And it's also, I think you can argue, one reason why the Brits enter the war once it started. Because they don't want the, the Germans to dominate the French coast. You know, because if the Germans dominate the French coast, they can project continental power into the Atlantic. And that leaves the, the Brits pretty exposed. I, I think that is a, an, an argument that you... You can make. You're going to see these mechanisms much more in, 1930, in the 1930s, obviously. Think about the, Jap the Japanese going, uh, getting raw materials all over the place. If you think about, if you think about Hitler, uh, you know, it seems suicidal. Why is he going for the Soviet Union? And I mean, the answer is he's going, he's going for raw materials, largely. That's, that's one of the big themes of Adam Tissa's wonderful book. You know? So the point is you can get your raw materials by buying them and paying for them with exports. That's the liberal bourgeois solution that, of course, Hitler doesn't like or you can just seize, the, seize them. And that's, that's partly what he ends up uh, doing. I talk about this, I have a paper with, with Bonfatti, who's a theorist in, in Italy, where we 
we, we think about these big wars. So the, you know, the standard hegemonic war story is that the, the rich country preemptively attacks the poor country who is rising because the rich country is afraid that the poor country will become too powerful. And the poor country might say, don't worry, we won't attack you, but the rich country don't believe them. Okay, that's the standard kind of story that the political scientists tell you. Um, but it was Japan who attacked Pearl Harbor, not vice versa, right? So, so how do we make sense of that? Uh, and we argue that it's partly these, these raw materials concerns, you know, because the poor country could be blockaded by the rich country. Then the poor country may have an incentive either to directly attack the rich country or to invade resource-rich areas. And both of those things happened in, in the 30s. And I should also point out there's a book that everybody's reading right now. Have you read this book yet? By Nicholas Mulder on sanctions. Everybody's reading this book now because it's about sanctions. But it's about the, the beginnings of sanctions. He's a historian of, in America somewhere. And he's, he's saying that one of the problems is that in the 1930s, you remember you know, Mussolini was sanctioned, right? Okay. Uh, and the League of Nations thought that sanctions would be an alternative to war that could lead to world peace and so on. And one of Mulder's arguments is actually all that did is it led to countries like Germany and Japan saying, well, to hell with that. If you can threaten me with sanctions, I better make myself sanction proof. And how do you do that? And the answer is by invading Manchuria or Southeast Asia or whatever. So it, it's basically the same argument as ours. Like we could replace the word blockade with sanctions and it would be basically the same argument. You know, so what do I draw from that? I draw from that the conclusion that if rising powers become seriously worried about being able to rely on the market for imports of food and raw materials, that can be dangerous. You know, so uh, it's a good thing if we can reassure them about this. And, and, the, and the broader point is the strategy can sometimes matter for globalization. Uh, so to conclude, did deglobalization begin in August 1914? I mean, clearly August 1914 had an impact, right? But what I've tried to argue is that actually globalization was already being undermined because of the purely domestic political economy implications of globalization itself. And strategically, it was also shifting power balances. That's always dangerous for international stability. And there were these fears that countries were becoming too vulnerable on, uh, and too subject to potential blockade and so on. Uh, that had an impact uh, on the Brits and the Germans and their relationship in particular. And so you could also ask, you know, if, 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 if this is a turning point, we don't know if it is yet, you know, but if it is a turning point, you know, in 20 years' time, will we say that the deglobalization of the future started last month? No, not, not last month, in February. You know, yes, you could argue it did. But equally, equally you could say that globalization was already being undermined, as we saw in 2016, by the income distribution implications of globalization itself. Actually, it occurs to me, I'm just thinking aloud now, but you could also argue that austerity could be partly be, be blamed, blamed on globalization, right? Because certainly in some countries, people have used the argument that we need to remain competitive, get international you know, investment and so on as an excuse to cut state budgets and lower tax rates. So, so there's that. Uh, we saw the globalization of capital markets that led to financial instability, not just in Europe, but globally in 2008, with the austerity that followed. And by the way, there's a big economic history literature showing that when you have financial crises in particular, it always seems to uh, benefit the extreme right. Don't know why that should be. You'd think the left would do well. It never seems to. It all seems to be the far right that does better. You know, that seems to be a reasonable historic constant. Globalization has led to the rise of new powers. Uh, and globalization has led to the emergence of strategic vulnerabilities. Uh, and so it's not clear that, that, that uh, you should conclude in 50 year time that you know, a particular war did the damage. Maybe uh, the damage was already being done from within. And if there's a policy recommendation here at all, it's remember your shock absorbers. And if you need to place certain limits on the extent to which international markets are integrated so as to maintain your ability to provide effective shock absorbers, that might actually be in the interests of openness in a sufficiently long run perspective. And I think I'll leave it there. Thank you, Kevin, for that uh, fascinating talk. I think also a very important talk with some important lessons for us. We have
Uh, I don't know, not very many minutes for questions, but if anyone has one, then uh, just put your hand up and there's a microphone over there which you need to use to ask your question. I'm sorry for going over. Thank, thank you so much for a fascinating lecture. You're drawing a lot on the analogies uh, between the 1930s, uh, end of the 19th century, and, and, and globalization today. But I think one thing that where, where the situation is strikingly different uh, is in terms of, of demography. If, if you look, for example, at, at birth rates uh, for women in, in both the 1930s and especially the, the, the 19th century, uh, age structure and so on, the vast difference today, where we are shrinking populations, you have a much ill share of the elderly population, which I guess has implications both for issues like interest rates, it has implications for consumption patterns, it, it has implications for um, sort of the way the government budget, it, it is, uh, the composition of the government budget, and I guess it also has some sort of accurate sort of implications for the ability to wage war and, and to engage in, in issues of settler colonialism and so on. So, so does, does the, ch the differences in, 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 in demography between these time periods have the things to say with regards to perhaps the limitation of what we can learn or does it expand it? That's a great question and I guess it probably merits actually not an answer but a conversation that would go for, for, for half an hour or something like that. I'm just thinking aloud. You mentioned the implications for interest rates, which is something I'm very interested in, actually. I wonder whether the secular stagnation debate that I guess you may be referring to will um, will fade away a little bit with what's happening because because we're going to see big increases in government expenditure now for all the wrong reasons. Um, but that may have good imp implication for interest rates going forward. And more positively, you might think that maybe the climate change investment agenda might lead to an increase in government expenditure also. So I wonder about that. Um, uh, strategically, I mean, I mean, if you were one of these IOR, real, you know, game theory, type people, I guess you would say if you have a declining population and you want to have a war, you probably don't want to wait until your population has declined too much. And that could be, and there are some people who make that argument about Russia, don't they? Uh, they say they're very uh, worried about declining demography and they want to grab territory with lots of, you know, Ukrainians and so on now. Um, yeah. Um, on the other hand, you would think that at some level, I mean, it may be lower resource dependence because fewer people need fewer resources and that might be a stabilizing f factor although there's going to be so much structural change as countries develop in the future and I think periods of structural change really do kind of create these dependencies and I would imagine that would dominate the declining population thing for a while but so those are just some thoughts yeah we could go on yeah one more question maybe yeah. Keith so I was thinking about. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, when I was thinking about you know the distribution of rents that globalization causes, this kind of redistribution, um, I was thinking about to what extent is this actually be like this kind of pushback nowadays being driven by material concerns of these kind of different groups in society versus this this redistribution of rents causing uh, a reordering of your social hierarchy. And so it's really the reordering of the social hierarchy that's that, that globalization causing uh, rather than, you know, this kind of change in your actual material well-being. Are you are you asking whether it's your relative position that matters more than your absolute position? Yeah, yeah, it's relative position within the society. Um, I mean, it could, it could it could be, right? It could be. Um, although, when you, when you listen to the complaints of people, I mean, it seems like more like it's their absolute welfare that they're complaining about. You know, they're complaining about, uh, you know, having to work three jobs to keep the mortgage payments up and, and, that, and that sort of thing, you know, the, the standard American complaints. So, so I, th I think people's absolute living standards matter a lot, actually. Yeah. I mean, I find, I mean, in America, that's a particularly charged debate because because there are, there are all sorts of hierarchies that are being changed and some of them thank God you know um, and so you know there's a feeling that if you kind of say that some of what went on in 2016 was based on economic interests I mean that's almost something you can't say sometimes in America anymore because it, it seems as if it's justifying the way people are, are voting but I, I, I think I think if you exclude kind of arguments like that from the public debate it's really worrying because Actually, because if, if that's what's going on, you want to know about it, because you can combat it, you know? 
And I guess it comes right down to an old-fashioned European social democrat or whatever you would call it. You know, I do think that we do have tools that we can use to, to, to yeah, to make these problems less. And, and if you, yeah. Well, on that note, we're out of time, I'm afraid. But uh, thanks to everyone for attending and for the questions. And of course, thanks again to yeah. Kevin. Tools and tech. Thank you.